to the body of the gold map of Mongolia. I'll uh, talk about the policy environment more like. So Mongolia is rich in minerals, of course, and uh, who in the deep in the mining industry knows already about the Mongolian mining information and the job of data. So anyway, so I, I don't, don't want to touch this uh, information again. So in general, we are rich in rare earth and copper, iron, coal, gold. Some of them is the world's biggest deposits, of course. We are attracting information to investors already. Of course, we are as a democratic nation. Uh, we have international uh, investors as well, such as we think uh, we talk about project, and we had some obstacles between the investors and the government of Mongolia. We have, of course, a uh, new democracy. It's like uh, 33 years old. We do have uh, some obstacles, and we do have goods and bads, of course. And, uh, we are, uh, I, which I describe is like uh, we learn by doing, we are improving to cooperate with our investors as well. So, uh, uh, please, uh, next slide. So, I would like to be honest with you that, uh, which, uh, as uh, you briefly heard about me, that uh, I've been working here and there. And also, I've been working in this uh, industry as well. And the, the Procon mine in Mongolia is actually the Canadian enterprise which I brought to Mongolia, and several companies I brought to Mongolia when I was working in the uh, private industry. So, in that regard, uh, uh, I decided to introduce you that uh, which challenges investors who face in Mongolia who is trying to invest in Mongolia. So, at first, the current laws and uh, laws and the force have conflicts, gaps, and all that. It faces a whole lot of challenges to investors. The invest, as investors from Canadian side, the international world always talks about this challenge. Please make things clear to the investors and stable as well. We uh, bet that everybody knows this uh, circumstance of all around this world is emerging, such as emerging countries such as like Mongolia. And uh, exploration lessons are issued on the basis of competitive selection, which is tendering. There's a, it's also challenged the investors as well. And the IRT and progressive IRT are both imposing, which means it costs a lot. And the anti-mining perception by local community in the mining project area, it's uh, also this uh, resource nationalism affects all of us all around the world, since even though this uh, social media is, of course. And the investment environment is not sustainable uh, and uh, very well time. So next slide. The current laws and force have conflict and gaps and overlapping. So which means it's like a, uh, currently this 80% uh, of the current mining law is already changed, which means the law from the beginning, the current, uh, now that the law is uh, shifted the A over 80%. And uh, conflict gaps and overlapping in the law of the mineral sector in Mongolia currently is like overlaps 267, conflicts 150, gaps 150. So before my presentation starts, I will tell you that I want to be honest with you that what we have, the challenges, what we are going to fix, how we are going to fix it. So next slide, please. So, in uh, 1997, we passed the first uh, mineral law in a democratic, as a democratic nation. It, the, the law was the name of one of the very favorable law in the world, because uh, for, you know, one of the very favorable law for investors on the world. And uh, in that regard, we've been attracted a lot of investors, including Canada. In 2006, it's a very remarkable year, because the a Utolka project, which started with iron power mines from Canada, and uh, joined it with the Rio Tinto, and uh, started this discussion in Mongolia a lot. And uh, it caused a lot of attention in Mongolia. It attracted a lot of attention. And it triggered this uh, resource nationalism a lot. And in that regard, there were a lot of uh, issues, and uh, that's why there's uh, if you see 2010, 2014, 2017, 2022, they changed the policy view a lot. 
and it uh, harmed to the investors and the industry a lot. And please next. And if you see the number of robotic licenses since 2006 to uh, until today, like 2022, it decreased a lot. So which means like now, now if you see it in 2000. Six number of mining licenses, it was like one, over 1,000. Number of exploration licenses, which was like over 4,300. Currently, it become like uh, uh, 1,700 mining licenses and 855 uh, exploration licenses. It decreased a lot, which means the investors skip it from us. Because of a lot of problems with the investors and our foreign friends. So, Next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, brief information that the mineral resources of Mongolia currently, which we are taxing in royalty tax. So it's like it uh, clearly shows you that this royalty is low nothing for the investors. And next slide. So currently, the Mongolian parliament is discussing about the update of this. Uh, uh, general law to make it favorable for the international investors. So I would like to spend a little time on it like that. The LTP is currently it's like mining license holders and concentration license holders. So, uh, the, the, before the LST base was like 5% and it added up, I would say it was like a, uh, not no limit, like up to like 20% some minerals. So it, uh, it escaped, it triggered a lot of scarcity to the investors. Currently, we are now talking about that uh, addition rates will be charged progressively based on the price we exceed the minimum price. So it's like, uh, I would say from the current draft, it's like up to 7.5%. That's the limit. And uh, copper, zinc, and the lead, molybdenum concentrates, the, the bases are different, of course. But for these minerals, it's going to be, for example, the London metal exchange price. And the second one, gold and silver, it's going to be central bank's price after the month. And metallic and non metallic minerals, it's going to be based on the more, more average published by Mongolian price of uh, published by Mongolian mining product. Exchange, which is big recently, uh, just before this uh, year, the end of this uh, 2020 year, the uh, parliament passed this law of uh, Mongolian mining product exchange, which would be open price for the uh, buyers. And next one, in metallic and non metallic minerals, we're gonna, it's, it's going to be royalty, so based on the contract price, if the price is not regulated, published by Mongolian mining product and exchange. It's clearly easy to understand. And domestically sold or used metallic and non metallic minerals based on sales contract price. The next one. So, so overall, uh, the means of solutions is that uh, no overlapping laws, gaps, or conflicts, consistent law for many years. And legal framework which enables granting exploration licenses based on application, not only on competitive selection, which means like we, you don't need to compete. To this uh, license sellers, of course, for example, it happened a lot, and it uh, causes to stop this granting of the licenses. So we now uh, we are now gonna be changed into the, the both ways, the tendering as well as uh, and uh, <coughs> application based. Progressive royalty will be uh, leave it on the income exceeding the income level by its primary amount, which is a very straightforward. Increase the income from local mining operations and support local developments. This is the main issue why this uh, uh, resource capitalism raised it. Because the locals did not get uh, much and they get the leftovers uh, and uh, contamination and the bad uh, outcome of the mining. And reduce the number of local permissions. Currently, it's a lot of permissions from uh, local communities. Now, we are changing it to just regulated by the central government, mostly. And uh, tax is going to be available from the investors. The, leave the old concept of the law on the strategic important minerals deposit and limit the further increase by the data loss. So, which means, like uh, in Mongolia, there is very unique top, uh, description about strategic important minerals deposit. It's like, it's like uh, some deposit which is uh, above 5% of GDP, 
could in, uh, impact the national uh, economy constitutes as a strategic deposit. So now uh, it, it also mitigates the investors to enter into bigger deposits. So that's why we are now limiting on this uh, concept. And the private funds can be used for mineral prospect works. And the uh, government was going to be in boost for that. And previously, previously it was uh, uh, restricted. And the increase, increases the minimum of the exploration expense on the areas granted based on application and keeping license fees. So which means like uh, some people previously, some companies bought the license and kept it in very cheap way, uh, fees, and sold it to the others. It, it actually influences the mineral uh, industry a lot and itself the uh, reputation itself. So uh, provision of effective population of office, which is favorable for the investors. And, uh, <coughs> The term of the important minerals is to be reflected in the law, and the government is uh, to approve the list of such minerals and uh, specific policies be, to be implemented with uh, respect to the important minerals. The next slide, please. Okay. Which uh, important minerals? This, this term is newly embedded into this uh, draft currently because uh, this, depending on the, for example, now around the world, is uh, increasing attention on the earth. We will consider on it, of course, and depends on this uh, world uh, trend, the important minerals list is going to be changed by the government of Mongolia, like the rest of the world. And uh, when issuing my licenses, A, and A means like uh, exploration license, uh, uh, and uh, enriching process of license B of minerals, granting of license to be subject to the financial guarantee of the closure upon leaving the minor production social plan approved. approved. So before we gonna issue this minor letters, we have to consider about the mine closure issues, enforcing it into the law currently that before it was not that much clear. So increase the participation of the local community and transparency of information. And we repealed the law on common minerals and the law on prohibition of the mineral exploration and mining cooperation at the Trade waters of the rivers project, protected zones of water, rivers, reservoirs, and for, for such area. So it's it also, <coughs> you know, that this uh, uh, early time of our democracy, there have been a lot of harm to this uh, nature and the environmental concern raised. Now we are trying to mitigate it and uh, save the face of uh, industry as well. And, uh, and also at the end, the new provisions on the social and government supported by license holders, of course. And uh, at the end, this uh, bad in the information from uh, this like bad misunderstanding so to transfer licenses have been attached, uh, applied to the royalties up to 10% uh, scaled a lot of investors into Mongolian uh, mining industry, so we are removing it from the law. And uh, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, next, we have a peer recorded presentation by Aksan Karihojai. He is Deputy Chairman of the Uzbek Committee uh, on Geology and Natural Resources. His career has really bridged these two areas of geology. I have to apologize to have uh, a change in our program uh, with the Uzbek representatives. Unfortunately, they cannot, they could not uh, join the conference today uh, because of some uh, uh, changes uh, on the uh, level of the mining industry. Uh, the people who are supposed to speak today are not able, they, they took off the, uh, the presentations from the panel. So just Absolutely. Thank you, Tatjana. Uh, then we'll go next to my colleague, Scott Dunbar. Uh, he works casually on questions like what mines look like in 100 years, so this will be a three-minute presentation, I think, Scott, yeah, <laughs> roughly. Um, he's been at UBC uh, at the uh, Norman B. Keeble uh, Institute of Mining Engineering for 25 years after a career in consulting, and has had various roles uh, at UBC shaping mining engineering education there. Please, Scott, t tell us about the innovation ecosystem. Well, thank you very much, Julian. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present here, um, to go into presentation mode. So what I want to talk about today 
is um, what we have to do to make things like what we've been talking about, all these mineral deposits in, uh, in, in, in the, make them happen. We need, a, we need a, some innovation to happen. And so I think there's a, a ready-made uh, ecosystem for innovation consisting of governments, uh, industry, and universities. And so I want to talk about that. Um, okay, so these are the, what we need from such an ecosystem are these. We, we need a highly skilled workforce, uh, economic development, access to resources, and environmental protection, and an advanced state of the art uh, in, in these countries. So next slide, please. Uh, so I've collected here a uh, little circles showing how we how these uh, groups are organized and or not organized as the case may be and is this the right what how, what structure should this have so what I want to talk about next slide please uh, start off with UBC as uh, an example of uh, a university um, there are other examples uh, but this is the one I know best UBC has about 70,000 students it's got uh, several um, faculties and departments. One is applied science. There are six engineering departments in that, four programs, three schools. It's got a faculty of arts, including 25 departments, and including Asian studies, where my colleague Julian works. And um, there's 100 faculty in that, in that, in that um, program or a, a department. They have a school of public policy and global affairs. There's a faculty of science with 10 departments, two institutes, a business school and a law school. Teaching and research related to mineral resources is done in many of these units, and that's what's interesting. So what I want to talk about today is big mines. Do we go for big mines or smaller mines? And then I'll uh, show off some mining technologies that I think we, that are being worked on at UBC and elsewhere, and I think have to be implemented. Uh, but it won't be a scary presentation of technology. So next slide, please. So big versus small. When we talk about um, mining, we typically think about large mining projects, especially in a country like in Eurasia, where there's a lot of deposits. And uh, so the, the tendency is to think about building the, these enormous deposits first. And those have, uh, first of all, high capital costs. They're complex. They're quite inflexible. Once you start with them, it's very difficult to make changes. Uh, base metals and gold are the uh, typical examples of the, uh, these kinds of mines. And large companies get involved in these and, and global suppliers. These all have their place. Uh, they, um, they're uh, in, incredible economic drivers. Oil so Goy, that John Gort mentioned, is uh, one example of that. But I want to make point out that there's a, some considerable advantages to smaller mining projects. Now, I don't mean a bunch of artisanal miners scattered across the countryside. I mean just smaller deposits that might be starters for bigger deposits. Um, these have a much lower capital cost. They're simpler. They're flexible. Uh, you can do stage development. And so uh, start off with one part of the project, learn from it, and then stay, go on to the next. Uh, next, no, back one, please. Uh, it's applicable to uh, small ore bodies. Uh, and some of these critical mineral deposits are small with variable grade, um, small companies. The end user markets for some of these mines are, uh, for rare earths in particular, they're thin. They're not well established like uh, base metal markets. So next slide, please. There are, this is an example of a modular processing unit. It can uh, tear, uh, it's a, this is for gold, uh, built by a company in uh, just outside of Vancouver and Langley. Uh, it's a uh, move, you can put it on, it's on a flatbed and it can go around from place to place and process uh, gold ores. Next slide, please. This is an example of uh, the kind of technology something was developed at UBC. Whenever you get one of these big shovels and they scoop up a, a lot of uh, blasted ore, there's a lot of waste in that and you don't want to process that. So what this shovel does is it has some sensors inside it. And it, it, it irradiates the ore and uh, figures out, okay, is this worth taking it to the mill and processing it, or should it go to the waste dump? And that's a huge advantage because mill, the, 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 the energy consumed and the money spent, uh, and a, a lot of the money spent is, is in the mill. You don't want to process waste. So this is one, uh, this, these are, this has been implemented at Highland Valley in, in uh, Kamloops near here, and it's been um, implemented in other parts of the world as well. Uh, 
So this is developed at UBC. Next slide. This is an example of the kind of small deposit I was thinking about. Uh, thinking about this is the Nechalacho rare earth mine in the Northwest Territories. It's a uh, very uh, small mine. It's currently only mining about 100,000 tons total. It mines about 5,000 tons a year. It's part of a larger deposit of 100 million tons. And then all of the, the mine is simply, uh, it, it, it separates the ore from the waste. Um, it, the, the ore is some mineral with a very strange name called bastinazite. It contains the rare earths. It's dense. And the, the other, the waste is the uh, quartz. And this machine on the upper uh, uh, on the upper side here, this machine is an ore sorter. That's all they have there. There's no water. Uh, it's just an X-ray that uh, looks at these, this ore and decides, okay, this can go in the bags for processing, or it goes to the waste dump. And that's all there is. This is operated by an indigenous group. Um, and uh, what's interesting about this uh, in the next slide is that they have, oh, sorry, back one, sorry. This, uh, this ore goes to a, a processing plant in Saskatoon, and from there, they have to find a buyer, an off taker. That ore is then processed in Saskatoon. Then it goes to Norway, where it's processed into rare earth oxides. Those rare earth oxides are then taken to a, a car manufacturer in Germany. So this mine, the uh, it's uh, Vital Metals is the name of the company, they have to organize that entire uh, value chain to make this thing work. And uh, this is one of the challenges of soil deposits. You need to find uh, of, of uh, markets with of metals with thin markets like the rares. Uh, you have to find a buyer. Next slide. This is some uh, technology that uh, is being worked on. It was actually being worked on by Tech in Vancouver. Um, they're trying to look at instead of these big monster haul trucks, you might we've all seen them. They're looking at a swarm of smaller trucks that are autonomous and electric, and Volvo makes these. And um, this is a, so they talk about large fleets of small autonomous trucks, and they're operating much like an ant colony. And so this kind of, this, we're, we're looking at this now, we have a student working on this at uh, UBC right now. Uh, very flexible, um, these, uh, just like in an ant colony, if an ant dies, it's gone forever, it doesn't matter. If one of these breaks down, you haven't, you haven't lost much production. This is 15 tons. Uh, but if one of those big haul trucks breaks down, you have lost a lot of capacity. So very interesting ideas. Next slide. Another interesting idea is the uh, bio microbes, bacteria actually have been interacting with minerals for 2.5 billion years. And there's, uh, they're, they're, they do this because by decomposing minerals, they generate, they, they uh, they uh, acquire energy and food. And so they're highly motivated from that. They're to actually get in to uh, be attached, to be associated with minerals. And that's what's led to what is known as a mineral microbiome. And so every anywhere there's a mineral deposit, you'll find microbes. And this microbiome is, we believe, more complicated than the human microbiome. And so the question is, there's a lot of adaptation that's occurred in that 2.5 billion years. Can we use that to extract metals? Next slide. Or to do remediation. So, for example, here is a, a copper uh, concentrations in the U, in the Yukon River, and, and uh, shown at uh, these uh, site B and C, there's a very high concentration of copper in the in the water, and that's because there's a bacterium uh, called Gallionella, and it's developed mechanisms to do, to detoxify its environment. Metals are are, are uh, toxic to uh, bacteria. So what they do is they sequester the back the metals in their organ in their organ in the organism, and it's a kind of a, a way of uh, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, um, and it's and that causes copper metals to precipitate. So there's a lot of high concentrations of copper in these in these areas. This is a very useful way of actually finding uh, uh, concentrations of metals and doing exploration. Uh, this is some work that's been done by a group in Kazakhstan, uh, and they are looking at ways of like bacteria can decompose coal to produce humus and uh, and uh, and get involved in remediation. So um, lots of potential for these, and we don't understand it all, but we're just beginning to. Uh, next slide, please. 
This is a project at UBC called the Mineral Mi Mining Microbiome Analysis Platform. And its basic goal is to take samples of metals and microbes at different uh, deposits and just find out what's there. What is, what is the genetic makeup of these microbes? And what are they doing? And how are they doing it? And how can we exploit it? So there's just, so this is a taste of the kinds of things that are going on at various universities in, in, uh, at, uh, and the most of this is at UBC, but, uh, and, uh, and, and some other companies. Tech is involved in this. Rio Tinto is involved. Uh, Alonia is a, is, a, is a biotech company. Next slide. So this is how I think we need to organize. Um, that those four, five circles we showed before. I've put the people in Central Asia, us, you and I, and, 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 and I mean, two people that live in Central Asia and the people that are working in Central Asia. I put that at the center. And then around the uh, up periphery, you have the governments, the universities, and industries. Um, or companies operating in Central Asia. And, um, but it's really the people that have to drive this. So, next slide. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Scott, well done. Such discipline from our speakers. Thank you so much. What a wonderful overview from government policy, both in Canada as well as in Central Asia, to interactions uh, with the university and, and the important role well, the people of Central Asia have been playing that as well. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for, for attending today. Um, this next panel is called the Commodity Outlook, Global Economic Uncertainty and Energy Transition. Um, we've got a keynote speaker, Jordy Mark, followed by three panelists, uh, Mark Ward, Darren Quink, and Galizma and Shun, sorry, uh, Mateov from uh, in Kazakh Invest. Um, so Jordy's going to give us a, a short overview of his commodity forecast for 2023 and then talk about long-term supply fundamental changes, um, the tr and energy transition, increased increase demand from that energy transition that I think a lot of people were not anticipating five to ten years ago. And so Jordy comes to us from uh, Australia originally, I guess. He's a PhD in mineral uh, exploration or new economics rather, and he's been an analyst uh, at Haywood, then went to the buy side for a while and is now head of, co-head of uh, research at Haywood, one of the uh, more prominent boutique mining investment firms here uh, in the city. So, Jordy, I'll hand it off to you. Chris, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation to present today. What, so in putting today, together today's uh, presentation um, really brought to life exciting, I think exciting for the future for minerals development, exploration and production globally. Uh, in, a, in a nexus of a combination of events, one is, you know, global urbanization patterns across uh, across Asia in particular, leading on to, to Africa and, and the Americas, as well as uh, you know, the potential for transcendence of new technologies replacing, you know, current, current uh, hydrocarbon liquid-based fuel sources for our transport industry. Into uh, into one that's more electricity driven. So uh, I'm uh, the head of mining and research at Hayward Securities, and we're a uh, we've been involved in funding exploration and mining development for about 40 years locally, uh, from uh, you know small scale explorers to to large scale miners, including the predecessor of a V2 well back in the days of Bima. Um, the lawyers they've got to talk about our oh, next slide, please. Yeah, looked at uh, some pretty exciting data in terms of where trends were for uh, urbanization uh, and for electricity sort of consumption rates uh, across the globe, in particular looking at, at Asia uh, and then also in the more sort of developed mature economies and when what the new EV sort of projections could look like. And next slide, please. So in terms of just uh, nominal forecasts, uh, this looks at uh, the Forecast for 2023 that we, we put together, and this was done in the business year of, uh, of where we had uh, production expectations in October last year. We were still bullish in terms of where we saw commodity price price direction on on, uh, on supply demand balance across a range of commodities, and obviously what we're seeing already this year we've uh, exceeded our expectations in, in a rebound in in maybe China coming back on the stream earlier than we thought, uh, but also in terms of the relative we'll call flattening of the, of the interest rate curve across central banks globally. 
So apart from commodity price, no, that's good. That's good. Apart from commodity price, you know, there's more than just a number that goes into that. Uh, how do we look at uh, production expectations out of the supply side, but also the demand drivers? So we're in, a, we're in an exciting time, and, and doing the analysis, to step back and look at, you know, we're at three years of COVID, and it's clouded our view in terms of people more inward looking. So we're in a sector that's more a long wavelength sort of supply driver. So you've got, you know, from exploration discovery to production in any country, it takes five, ten, probably more than ten years to come into break. So we're a very long lived, long life mining cycle. So we need to look at long term trends and the drivers that, that underpin uh, what the supply side uh, is going to look like. So I think what we saw earlier last year and uh, was a supply shock, particularly in terms of energy. Energy, uh, having your own domestic energy is very important, and we saw that across Europe uh, last year, and I think that really means you'll have a rotation in energy supply and diversification, in particular nuclear and natural gas coming back into the forefront, um, and also going domestic. You need security of your own energy supply to be able to drive your own economy. Together with that, new technologies uh, enable, I guess we'll call it technology driven trans transcendence, where new economies and, and expanding economies can jump past established infrastructure to adopt EV rather than a hydrocarbon based economy for the automotive fuel cycle. So there's some very interesting sort of trends that are coming out, and, and, and that, that point on this technology transference for me was first led by my first visit to the DRC. 20 years ago or something, where you completely skip the hard code, hard line telephony circuit into mobile phones. So there's, there's an opportunity for new economies and advanced economies to adopt um, new technologies. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we looking at? The metal demand mix uh, and evolving mosaic, and it really is a, is, a, is a mix of Components that go into urbanisation trends, but also into the new macro for EV sort of adoption. And uh, that's what I'll talk about in terms of evolve and transcend current socioeconomic <laughs> urban patterns of consumption and output, and, and the role, I guess, in terms of the mining industry and emerging economies have in that play. And I'll look firstly at urbanisation trends and then at the sort of paradigm changes in consumption that we're looking going forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so this looks at, I'm going to quickly on this, the last kind of 50 years of development on the, on the major major economies, most populous economies globally. And this just looks at percentage of urbanization and you go across 50 years of, of history. And the biggest trends are when you get to be an established uh, mature economy, your urbanization rates plateau, you know, normally around about upper 70s into the 90s. Um, when you're on that sort of growth platform into an urbanisation, most of your uh, people are coming into urban centres or centres are evolving in their urban nature. Uh, you have uh, upticks in requirements, and that is actually a driver for commodity consumption. And the most immediate sort of driver that will be in everyone's memory is is that of China. China's this red line, and there's a sort of paradigm change here over this period about 30 years, I guess, from here, but that's a significant, you've got the most populous country having a significant change in growth rate in terms of urbanization that drives commodity consumption. We're seeing that if they continue that trend, as most nations do, um, when they reach, a, a, I guess, a ceiling or a equilibrium. Um, you know, there's a, if we project this going forward, we've got another two, three decades of the same rate of consumption coming out of the most populous nation. Underpinned by, you know, the second most populous nation about to probably sort of help that uh, demand going forward. And I put Cote d'Ivoire here for a reason, uh, and I'll get onto that going forward. Um, next slide, please. So coupled with the underlying components of urbanisation, which relate to steel, coal, metallurgical coal, um, and, and copper, you have the electrification. Uh, and the establishment of an infrastructure around electricity, which is important for EV. So, at, with established economies, they, in this case we're looking at the United States and also look at Japan, over time, and this looks about 40 years' history, they build up their electrical grid capacity, and then once they reach a, a maximum, there's efficiency to scale that come in, 
the use decline to, the, to an equilibrium point. We also see that about the same point in Japan. South Korea is coming up to that point. They'll probably stabilize soon. But look here, this is China and the growth rate in, in terms of electricity consumption. And China has a long way to go to reach equilibrium. So we still see a lot of demand for underlying uh, electricity uh, grid expansion. And these are main drivers for the, for the consumption and need for things like iron, copper, uh, coal, and other elements that are coming with that. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we see with the EV components? There are two components. We have stagnating sort of energy demand, but with EV coming in, we've got rotation from a hydrocarbon-based energy supply to an electricity supply uh, augmentation for mature economies, increasing demand for copper, but also we have the ability for, I guess, the maturing economies to come through and actually transcend um, some of the hydrocarbon-based uh, drivers to add more copper into their underlying electricity for the consumption. Next slide, please. So there's a good case for where we see the drivers for underlying commodity consumption, and I'll get into where they're going to come from. So for me, uh, ultimately, we're our group, uh, we see the underlying components. How do we get to a pathway for EV future? It's driven from current technologies. Has to be, um, because you can't, you can't build a pathway of the future with many things we don't actually have a grasp on yet. But we hope to get there. So we still see an underlying need for diversification in current fuel sources, but that will that mix will change into the future into more renewables. We we'll retain nuclear, uh, and I, it's difficult to see a, a complete loss of natural gas and coal over the next several decades. Um, next slide, please. So how do we enable this paradigm shift, and how do we part, be part of that, uh, that that component there? We need a tangible supply of some components to go into that, and that's been a topic for a number of speakers already today. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to focus on copper. So I'm going to do two more slides in the video. So, you know, copper's everywhere, right? Look at that. This is just a cutoff, and actually, if I was just to change the cutoff and size of deposits, pretty much in every every continent that we dare to explore. Um, so it's everywhere, it's not rare, but can we access it? No, no, we can't. Next slide, please. So copper's everywhere, uh, but we can't access it or, uh, okay. So I've looked at here in terms of projections for, this is time going out to 2030. This line looks at you know, likely rates of um, supply side increase if we were to look at the current resource base globally. We could achieve you know, a 5% CAGR or compound average growth rate to supply future demand. And with this, you have no problem that uh, you know, bringing out an EV sort of response and, and filling the automotive market uh, with uh, components, particularly for copper in this case. Other commodities are actually in a worse condition. But there are many factors which many people in mining understand that will hinge in terms of rates of development of projects that are economics, there's social issues, uh, there's so many issues with timing. So deposits <coughs> not just don't all make it into, into production. Next, please. So instead of actually having a curve like that at 5%, it's more likely going to be a best scenario at 1% production rate. There's a very uh, low production rate, right? and in some cases, part of, part of the mine industry, uh, look at actually the declining rates from around about 2025. So we look at the next supply, next, uh, next graph. So how does that relate to demand? If we look at the IEA projections, they're, and this is their 1.5% curve, so we start to see a a difference between the actual supply and the demand coming into play in the future at actually a modest rate of, uh, of change of the demand on the EV side. So what this means is, yep, we need to find more deposits. Uh, next slide, please. But if we look at actually uh, something that's probably more moderate and probably commensurate with global policy or, or a want from the population, is it a, more likely a 3% sort of rate. So we've got a massive divide starting to, to build in terms of how do we actually achieve what we want to do in the future and, and the problem is, is, is obviously paramount. We need to actually unlock supply to deliver into the demand requirements in the future. Next slide please. Okay, so I mean as part of an industry we, we explore, we look for deposits, but the nature of production and exploration has actually become generally across the sector far more conservative. 
And this looks at the last 20, 25 years of production, and even the number of discoveries per annum across all, uh, most major commodities. And what we've seen, certainly over the last 10 years, we've had a, a lack of discovery success um, across commodities. And that's usually because, at the moment, the industry is more risk-oriented, uh, and they're looking at resource expansion around existing resources, around existing mines, and not discovering larger new systems that can augment production of the fly, rather than change the duration of production. So, uh, next slide, please. And how does that manifest itself? If we look at uh, copper in particular, looking at the last 25 years, this, is, this looks at annual budgets going into exploration on drilling for discovery. And basically, we've had a good, good increase over the last 10 years, uh, but most of that, two thirds of it, has actually gone into trying to define resources around existing production or resources that are known and not into discovery. If we go on the, on the gra grassroots side, the green section here, we've seen a rather flat sort of curve lower than the, than the highs in 2012 going into trying new discovery success. So that, that's simply just not enough. We need to actually put more money into, into the sector to explore for new deposits to supply the dream and the need in the future. This is where I think ultimately, if you can mix, mix life, please, you've got to go where the rocks are. And for me, I was lucky to, to um, accept a, a an invitation to visit Kazakhstan last year, um, and I've worked in copper mines and coal mines and explored for uranium and map uranium deposits, and, and actually I was actually quite struck at the scale and uh, efficiency of the operations that I saw in Kazakhstan. I haven't been to I've got Mongolia as yet, but my BAC students have worked on all these old work um, uh, through exploration and discovery 20 years ago, uh, and the outstanding success. Um, so you want to go to the rocks, uh, and as part of this, and, and some of the work that I do currently looking at, at um, gold production globally, I've seen there's an opportunity for, for emerging countries to play a big part in tomorrow's supply. And that, a good example of that comes out of West Africa, and we've been looking at for almost two decades. Um, and, and their ability to define an, an established policy, mining policy and framework around exploration, discovery and production, uh, to provide stability around fiscal uh, arrangements on those discovery and, and development uh, uh, assets, um, has predicated a history of production increase with West African nations now being the largest production center for gold globally. So they've increased their production over the last 10 years. 80%, and they'll continue to grow through discovery success. And what they've done is obviously you want a framework around policy, stability in, in, in the actual fiscal policy that goes into how you go. It doesn't really matter what the, the details are as long as it's stable. Um, if you change governments, as long as that policy is stable. If you want to change, there's a dialogue that happens going into change on both sides. And that's Stability over time has led to production and revenue increases um, for countries, but also gold production for those countries in particular. One of them, one of the chief sort of success stories is Côte d'Ivoire, um, which I've visited a few times now, where in particular the stability in terms of framework um, and fiscal policy has been augmented by a clarity in terms of understanding that permitting regimes with the same, same quality uh, as, as other mature countries, but they actually have a, a lower time period of review. So if you can get a review period of two years rather than what we're starting to see in first world jurisdictions of five plus ten years, you'll get preference of capital exploration to be able to discover your natural resources. This discord or ability to be able to disintermediate between the established mature economies provides an opportunity for you to jump way ahead of them and actually be the sources of tomorrow's growth. So I'd say that's the opportunity to be able to um, attract explorers uh, to develop your natural resources uh, hand in hand um, with, uh, with local stakeholders. So I'll leave it there. I think it's a good, good opportunity ultimately to fund tomorrow's growth. People want an EV growth, but it's not going to happen easily because we don't have the commodities readily available to be able to action that. So 
everyone has to work together to be able to enable that in, a, in an open, transparent policy. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. Um, our next panelist speaker is Mark Ward with uh, B2 Gold, um, our sociologist who spent, I think, 36 years. Um, now focuses on evaluation, so he'll have a, a wealth of knowledge, I'm sure, of all things gold around the world. And um, Mark's topic is, I think, gold's time to shine in a time of uncertainty. Mark, welcome to the Thank you very much, Olaf. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the CECC conference today. Uh, I'd like to introduce B2 Gold and the topic time to shine, gold time to shine. I'll get to that towards the end of the talk, um, but I do think there's some significant upside coming for gold in the future. Could we have the next slide, please? So B2 Gold has been, uh, it, it, it emerged from the, uh, from the purchase of uh, our assets by Kinross in 2007. And the same management group just continued onwards with B2 Gold, B2 being in that direction. We weren't allowed to keep the name Beamer 2 because Kinross refused to let us have it. Makes sense, why would you? Um, anyway, B2 Gold emerged in 2007. Um, we were lucky because the gold price crashed just after we made a $100 million IPO, which really was the foundation for us moving forward because we were able to at that time, purchased CSM, uh, a group in Nicaragua who were struggling to complete the mine build. Um, so we took them over and we had very, very um, successful operations there for many years, which we just recently sold. Currently, B2 Gold has three mines around the world, and our flagship is the Pecola mine in Mali. Um, and I will show you a slide later on which describes what we're doing there at the moment. The other two mines are Masbati in the Philippines and we have Ochikoto in Namibia. Both of those mines have, have probably had their heyday and they're getting towards the end of their mine life. So we're very strongly focused right now on looking for and um, hopefully purchasing the next big mine for our, our next stage of growth. Gramolosi JV, as you see indicated there in Colombia, that was the JV with Anglo American. And we just publicly announced that uh, both groups are going to put that on hold and look for a way to sell that to a new partner. So that's ongoing at the present. Um, we also have uh, a very strong exploration arm. Um, last year and this year, we've, we've um, committed to $68 million in exploration spending. Um, and probably one of our the two main areas of exploration spend right now are Pocola and the Pocola complex, where we're going to spend at least half of that money. And then I have up here Central Finland, or Central Lapland, the Finnish project, where we're focusing uh, currently. We have other exploration properties around the world, but too many to put on one slide. Here's the next slide, please. So this is uh, B2's gold production growth from 2007. You see this is from 2012. Um, we went into production by purchasing CSM and, and then finishing that build in 2009. Since then, we've picked up um, the Philippines, Masbati Mine, then we moved on to Tocola, and as you can see, Tocola has now become the, our monster. Five to six hundred thousand ounces a year, and that is a, that's the only slide I'm going to show you today which describes um, our, our plans there and where we where we see our future at, at the current time. Uh, as you can see, our AISC is um, remaining rel relatively flat, so that's been that's allowed us to, um, to obviously generate good revenues. And with those revenues, we currently have a, a nice war chest, and that's the way we're going to move forward, looking for our next uh, acquisition. Next slide, please. B2 Gold has kind of made its mark in the market by um, being willing to go almost anywhere. Um, and it goes way back to, to Beamer Gold. And I guess to the, the fact that the, the management group has been together probably 30, 35 years now. Um, we're now seeing a couple of retirements. I mean, everyone does get old eventually. And 
we need new blood in the organization. So we've lost a few people to retirement and they've been replaced. So you'll see B2 Gold moving forward with a, a slightly different philosophy. But as you can see from this slide, um, we went into Chile just post the um, Allende, um, the Dorotho Allende and Pinochet coming into power, which most people would say is a silly move. Why go to Chile at that time? We did that, and this is Bima Gold, of course. We did that, and we made a success of the Julieta mine, uh, no, not the Julieta, sorry, the Refugio mine at the time. And then Cerro Casali was a discovery which ended up being 25 plus million ounces of gold with um, copper. Um, we've since sold that, and I think it's owned now by Barrick and Kinross, I think. What's that? Anyway, it hasn't yet been um, put into production because it is an enormous capex item. Post that, we went into Russia um, when gold prices were about $250 an ounce. Again, going to Russia, low gold price, people would have said that's a crazy move. We managed to purchase the Julieta mine, which is a small epithermal gold producer, and we operated that for a few years successfully. And on the back of that success and our gaining our reputation in Russia, we were able to then purchase the Kupol operation. And as we were um, developing that and actually beginning to start the construction phase, that's when Kinross came in and made us an offer that we couldn't refuse. So that was the end of Bima Gold. Kinross purchased us for 3.5 billion, I think. And really the Kupol mine from then onwards became um, one of the main pillars of Kinross's recent success. So we went from Russia, we moved on then to um, Nicaragua, Namibia, the Philippines, and Mali. But I guess the, the, um, what I'd like to say about this is that B2 has never, BEMA and B2 has never shied away from jurisdiction. We've always been willing to go where the, the projects are and handle the jurisdictional risk as a consequence of that. Next slide, please. So this is the Pecola complex. This is our flagship operation. Um, you can see the Pecola itself sits here, and this, this block has been the mainstay of our operation. But you can see here, there's Pecola. We, um, we picked up this large block of ground. We picked up the Bacalobi ground in the middle, and we're now developing resources up here in the Anaconda area. But as a consequence of success there in Mali and getting to know the Malian government and, and having a relative success there, we've since picked up a number of ground, number of pieces of ground around it. And the idea is to create a complex where a lot of these resources that we hope to develop in the future will feed into either this main Pecola mine here, or we may end up putting a, a, an oxide plant up, up north. So this is likely to continue to produce for many, many years going forward. Next slide, please. One of the other things that I guess has um, not set B2 Gold aside, because many mining companies do this, but what's really contributed to our success is the fact that we have, through this large employee base, uh, I think 90-something percent of which is local, um, we've been able to give back to the government 407 million in taxes and royalties, employee wages, of course, create an enormous amount of local um, wealth, uh, local purchasing as well has been important. And wherever we are, and it's, uh, it's a, just a fact of life with uh, foreign investment now for mining companies, it's a social investment. So you can see we spent $10 million right now on just on direct community investment. That doesn't include all of the other stuff that we do on each of the mines as well. Um, as you can see there, 97% of our total workforce is, is local employees. And that's been an important part of our success as well. Empowering the local, um, the local work, workforce and, and giving them management positions and letting them essentially decide the direction of the company locally. Uh, next slide, please. We have also spent a lot of time and effort in um, Central Asia. We've looked at numerous projects throughout that area. And re um, our most recent venture has been in Uzbekistan. Um, we have a, a project here, the 
Sarah's managed to run away, but it should have been sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> We're not in Turkmenistan, and we don't plan to be any time in the future. Um, we have been working. We have been working in Uzbekistan on a, a local project there, very close to Murantau. And uh, we're committed to looking for new projects there, um, always assuming that we are, we're able to establish successful political relationships with the Uzbek partners and hopefully get more and better projects. When you enter a new country, you're unlikely to be given the better projects. You've got to earn your stripes, which means being committed to, uh, to working in their country, committed to grassroots exploration and smaller projects, develop your reputation, and then hopefully you'll get the better projects down the road. Um, this area, I guess you could say that the Central Asian area has been reasonably stable for many years, in Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. We're surrounded by a number of countries which we, as a, as a group, will not go to. And one of the reasons we don't go to those countries is personal risk. If the executive is not willing to go there, then the employees are not going to go there. So this area stands out as being stable in an area in which has been very unstable for many years. And we hope to be able to continue working in this area for many years to come. Next slide, please. So let's get back to the topic of the, of the talk itself. Um, gold's time to shine. This is just 2022 annual production by country. You can see China leads the way with 370 million ounces. But prominently among them is Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan in the top 15 or so. Um, and that, that really speaks to the fact that these countries have a, a great future going forward in the gold industry. And B2 Gold, having a strong balance sheet and being in Uzbekistan at the time, is well positioned to hopefully take advantage of this region and, and more investment. Next slide, please. This is my last slide, and really I, I was interested to hear Geordie's talk today, talking about the, the future and um, commodity production having plateaued, possibly, and in some cases declining. And so you may ask yourself, why is it gold's time to shine? Well, in markets where the gold production is decreasing, and there's still a demand, the, the logical conclusion is higher gold prices. So our feeling is that gold has a time to shine through increased gold prices. And I think we're all looking forward to benefiting from that. And that's my talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, our next panelist Darren Quint. Darren spent um, 10 or 12 years with Oceana Gold. We sort of crossed paths around that time many years ago. Um, Darren is now the president of Eris Minerals, Eris Copper, uh, doing copper exploration, I believe, copper porphyries in Kazakhstan. So, uh, Darren, mic is yours. Thanks, Olaf. Good morning, everyone. And just before um, I, I talk a little bit about RFs and, and our experience in Kazakhstan, I wanted to make a special note as well of um, the presenters in the first panel uh, from the Government of Canada. I, know, I think what we heard uh, was um, this new uh, critical minerals uh, strategy. Um, I think it's so important not only for Canada uh, and the world, but um, not only for companies that are here exploring, developing, and, and hopefully building mines in Canada for those really important minerals that we use in everyday life. But B2 is a great example. Ours is another example. Um, we're creating companies that are elsewhere, not in Canada. Uh, but those minerals, of course, are found all over the world, as, as Jordan was saying. Um, and myself, having spent my entire career with Canadian companies, but not Canadian companies looking in Canada, uh, but exploring, developing, building mines in other parts of the world, the Canadian advantage, um, Canadian companies, I think, have some of the best reputations, if not the best reputation, uh, partnering. Partnering with countries, partnering with other companies around the world um, to develop those important minerals that we need. Uh, and so I just a bit of a shout out to companies like B2 that for 20 or 30 years have actually been based here, but have been looking uh, and, and producing minerals in other parts of the world. And, and I think there's a lot of opportunities for Canadian companies to partner in Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan, and Mongolia, and bring that technical, uh, social uh, know-how, and of course, 
as Canadians respect um, as well. So um, I don't want to, I've got some obligatory cautionary notes which says that some of the stuff I'm, I'm telling you may or may not happen in the future. But I wanted to um, just build a little bit on what Jordy was talking about. And I think just some, some very simple statistics that uh, as a gracious reader, I, I see some of this stuff. And I think that in general society, not only in this country, but in, in, you know, around the world, we don't sometimes appreciate the facts. Um, uh, the facts of, of the importance of things like energy, for example. Over the last year, I think you know the world has become uh, much more attuned in terms of security of energy. How important is energy? This is um, from um, a statistic that I pulled out, and, and Jordi had some stuff on the IEA as well. But many in this room would probably not believe that um, today, still about 83% of the world's energy comes from carbon comes from coal, it comes from oil, it comes from gas. And 20 years ago, that number was about 83%. Right? So 83, 84, 82, 84, it hasn't changed much in 20 years, despite the fact that all the investment that's gone into renewables. Um, and of course, that's part and parcel because the demand curve. We've all got cell phones in our pockets. We're all encouraged to change from gas to heat pumps to heat our homes. Uh, we're all encouraged to drive electric cars. Where does it come from? Uh, and so I think the practicalities about as we transition are such that it's important that we all realize as well that energy is kind of important. I mean, we've got lights on above us. We like to heat up our home, uh, heat up our homes, heat up our dinners. Um, but it doesn't happen to magic. Just some other points that I thought I would include here as well. I mean, the International Energy Agency. Um, actually coming in just, just recently in a report, I saw the rapid deployment of clean energy technologies as part of energy transitions implies a significant increase in the demand for minerals. And in fact, I read something two weeks ago that said that some estimates, um, in fact, this was a professor out of France, uh, he, was, he believes that the world will consume more metals and minerals in the next 30 years than it has in its entire history to date. That is phenomenal. 30 years from now, we will consume the same amount of metals and minerals in our, in our everyday lives than the world has to date. So where are they going to come from? And I'm here, of course, going to talk a little bit about copper and the importance of copper. Uh, and we saw that in, in Jordy's uh, presentation as well. But uh, Wood McKenzie last year put out a statistic that in order to meet that increase in demand, again, it's not only the supply, but the increase in demand that we have for critical minerals, is that from now through the 2040, we need to maintain what we currently see in terms of production globally on that map, but we need to add another 200,000 tons of copper per annum uh, from a new mine. That's the equivalent of the 10th largest copper mine in the world operating today. We need to do that every year for the next 18 years. And then the bad news is that when we get to 2040, we actually need a new mine the size of Escondida, effectively, which is the largest copper mine in the world every year moving forward to 24. So I think it, it kind of puts it into perspective the fact that we, we need to work together that if we want to transition and we want to um, you know try to protect what we all love in this town in this city uh, where we raise our kids um, we do need to work together and I think that Canadian advantage um, working with Canadian companies um, to develop it whether it be here in Canada in Kazakhstan, in Turkey, in Uzbekistan, um, it's really an opportunity for us, not only here in Canada, but as a society. Okay, I'm going to need some help on the, the slide clipping. It was worked on the first couple of slides. Thanks very much. That's great. So copper. So talk a little bit about copper. Why is copper important? Um, I've already mentioned a few uh, just day to day. I mean, even in fact, sometimes you'll see now in, in door handles. I was in the tech uh, resources office, uh, and you'll see on the door handles they're actually I've got copper built into them because it's antibacterial. We use copper in hospitals. Uh, we of course use it to turn the lights on. We all turn the lights on this morning when we woke up and brushed our teeth. That wouldn't happen without copper. Um, but you know. Things that we're, we're doing today that are more renewable, if we look at the electric cars that are running around, there are about four times much, as much more copper in those than the regular cars that are um, that we've been used to in the past. And that picture in the bottom right-hand corner there, I love that photo. 
Um, that's, a, that's a photo of the inner workings of a, a submarine um, cable that's used to connect uh, wind turbines. Uh, and so a big wind field, for example, in the sea, uh, can have more than 2,000 kilometers of that cable intertwined back and forth between the wind turbines and then getting to shore to move the power to homes, whether it be in Norway or the UK or Scotland, every meter of that cable, and I said it could be 2,000 kilometers of that, every meter of that cable requires 50 kilograms of copper. Uh, so there's not a lot of substitutes for copper, uh, and it's one of the reasons why at RS, uh, in our short 18 months uh, really as a company, we are focused on copper and we're focused on copper and calcium. If I could get the next slide, please. Thank you. So just real quickly, uh, we've been public for about six months. Uh, we just recently welcomed Tech Resources, so one of Canada's largest diversified mining companies uh, as a strategic shareholder in the company. Tech is, I think, the world's largest uh, still making coal and zinc uh, miner uh, globally. Uh, and they, uh, too, are, are quite interested in, in Central Asia. And so we're very pleased to have them on board and uh, I'm sure they will learn alongside us as we continue to learn about all the great opportunities that have in there. Uh, so there you, there you can see it. We're focused in the northeastern part of the country, about three hours from uh, Canada. And, uh, and for us, uh, as what we would classify as an early entrant uh, into Kazakhstan as an explorer, uh, we got involved there about 18 months ago uh, and are, are focused primarily in and around a town called Ekbeskus, uh, which is about three hours from Astana. Uh, and, and what was really appealing for uh, Tim Berry, my business partner, who in fact um, was uh, living here. He's originally a Kiwi. He's now relocated his entire family to Kazakhstan. He's got two young daughters. That's how confident we are in terms of the opportunity in Kazakhstan, not the least of which is that Almaty is a spectacular city to live in. Uh, and it looks very similar, as someone mentioned um, earlier today, to Calgary uh, with the mountains in the background. Um, but we, we see in Kazakhstan and the opportunity uh, not only to move forward with regards to the opportunity to make discoveries in, in the copper and copper gold, uh, but then to be able to, to move those forward uh, and develop them and turn them into mines, they really help uh, to fill that gap uh, on uh, copper in particular. Um, we've already identified a significant deposit, which is a flagship for us, but then have been able to kind of get into the country and pick up a substantial land package in what we think is a highly prospective belt. Uh, and, and really have been able to do that on the basis of um, uh, a mining act, a mining law that is based on Western Australia. Uh, so it gave us a lot of comfort, I think, in terms of when, when Tim was, you know, evaluating opportunities around the world, um, when, you know, Kazakhstan took some very uh, deliberate sort of measures, I think, to up, update and, and to change uh, the mining law. They, they took Western Australia, they actually took also Ontario and, and Quebec, and they took the best things out of them. Uh, and, and largely copied it. So it's something that we were familiar with uh, and gave us a lot of confidence. This is just a map of, of some of the players that, that are in this country um, that, that are mining. Uh, again, not necessarily super well known uh, in terms of the fact that the, the endowment that Kazakhstan has, but I think more importantly, some of the largest companies in the world are active there. Uh, Glencore, which is one of the largest diversified mining companies in the world, 20% of their EBITDA. Uh, in 2021 came from Kazakhstan, uh, Fortescue out of Australia, Rio Central, of course, out of, out of the UK and Australia, uh, and then great companies like Chemical, which were mentioned earlier uh, today as well. But still, um, Kazakhstan's a big country, uh, and there's lots of space for many more. Um, of course, we'd like to get a few more projects ourselves before it gets too crowded, but um, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, open for many opportunities. And, and it was also mentioned by Marilyn earlier, uh, the ambassador, uh, with regards to mineral production. So top 10 in the world for many of the things that we use in everyday life. Um, and uh, on, on top of that, this in the world in terms of refined copper exports. So not only are uh, companies mining it, but it's being refined and it's being shipped out to um, uh, places where we can turn it into copper wire or turn it into cars or turn it into submarine cables. And so the infrastructure to, to add that secondary tertiary processing is also in the country as well. 
So for us at, at RF, as I mentioned, we're focused uh, in and around uh, it's really a city of about 130,000 people called FTP2, as you can see there. We've uh, assembled uh, more than 3,000 square kilometers of, of licenses focused on copper gold. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of walking and exploring to be done there over the next number of years. Jordy's had the opportunity to come out and visit it uh, this past summer, uh, and a spectacular part of the world, and really, you know, great country for uh, for making up, uh, you know, new discoveries and, and developing deposits. And in fact, just in and around um, you know our project, um, there's a long mining history. Uh, at Juice itself is a town, as I said, 120, 130,000 people, and, and really. Uh, is on the on the back of uh, the fifth largest uh, coal mine in the world. Uh, this mine was uh, first established in, in modern times in 1964. It's been operating every year since then, and it still has a 100-year reserve ahead of us. And it, it underpins a lot of the power generation in Kazakhstan. And as we know, in Kazakhstan, um, which is committed to net zero by 2060, they will uh, transition, uh, you know, to gas and ultimately nuclear. Very well placed for nuclear as well. Um, but what that means for us is that there's a very strong understanding uh, of mining uh, and the importance of mining. Uh, and as even Don Lindsay, the, the former chief executive of Tech, uh, mentioned last summer, uh, and as I mentioned, Tech the shareholder, uh, he mentioned in the second quarter of the report, he said it is getting very difficult to build mines anywhere in the world today. Uh, and so finding jurisdictions and opportunities where you can make uh, discoveries of these important minerals that we need in our everyday. Uh, but then most importantly, then being able to turn them into mines so that we can extract those minerals. Because it's one thing to make a discovery, but if they're still on the ground, then we're not getting the benefit. And I was once told by a, a former colleague of mine that mining is all about taking resource capital that's in the ground and turning it into human capital. Uh, and uh, Professor Scott Dunbar talked a little bit about that as well uh, and the involvement of universities. So there's a, a lot of uh, opportunities that taking what's in the ground and turning it into things that we need uh, also creates a course of society. Great infrastructure. Uh, as I said, um, power is, uh, you, you get out in the, in the step and, and have a, a chance to, to look at this you know, beautiful landscape that's very, very flat. In fact, you see some pictures here from the geology team out in the field this last summer. Um, and um, often the, the only thing you can see in the landscape are power lines, uh, power lines that are, that are leaving power stations to head to create power. So People can heat their homes and turn their lights on in Kazakhstan. So it's uh, it's a it's a fascinating part of the world and one that we've had uh, a lot of support um, you know, from Ambassador Kemal Dinov and, and Roland and the team in, in Ottawa uh, and, and also uh, from Kazakh Invest. Uh, Yalma Ben is going to speak uh, briefly. We're very happy there uh, and we've been very impressed uh, so far with the opportunity. If I could get the next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a quick slide to show in terms of the, the, the opportunity I think that we see in Kazakhstan as well. We look at places that are very well known in terms of producing uh, copper uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, porphyry type deposits, which is what we're focused on, tend to happen in clusters. Uh, you know, Chile, the world's largest copper producer, you can see across the belt that spans about 500 kilometers. Is, makes up the, the bulk of those deposits and you've got more than you know 20, 25 uh, porphyry deposits. Uh, Arizona and Mexico, that belt again, a similar size, almost 40 uh, deposits known. Peru, Ecuador, same thing. And in the Philippines where I've been involved with developing a copper mine as well, uh, same thing. And so in Kazakhstan, we think that it's definitely underexplored. Uh, the country has done a great job in terms of pulling together uh, all the historic data so you can access that and, and you can see in the belt that we're focused in there's really only three known portraits but uh, you know we think that as time progresses that as, as more companies get involved and, and RS uh, continues to be able to invest along with our partners we'll be able to make that map on the left perhaps uh, similar to some of the ones on the right. Just real quickly on, on Kazakhstan um, you know as an investor there um, I didn't know a lot about Kazakhstan 18 months ago, um, you know, before going there. Uh, but the more that I dug into it, and the more that I um, kind of learned about it, the more excited I got about it. Uh, you know, I read recently as well that you know the foreign direct investment into that uh, into Kazakhstan, uh, 20 to 30 percent of that annually comes from the U.S. and, and more than 40 percent comes from Europe. Um, and so uh, a lot of Western investment uh, in Kazakhstan. 
uh, and of course we're uh, you know we're one of those investors. It's done a great job on, on removing uh, and minimizing bureaucracy uh, as far as uh, establishing business. Uh, this World Bank study is done annually, uh, and, uh, and this was from 2020, and in fact it ranks equal with Canada and Ireland on an ease of doing business scale uh, globally. Uh, and so this has really nothing to do with mine. This is if you wanted to set up a possible stand or a lemonade stand in Canada, or you wanted to do one in Kazakhstan, it would be just as easy to do it in Kazakhstan as it would be in Canada. Uh, and I think that's been our experience so far as well uh, in terms of the processes. And, uh, and to be honest, I think if my daughters were to set up their lemonade stand in front of my house here, we'd probably need to get a permit. And I don't think you need to do that in Kazakhstan. <laughs> Uh, next slide, please. And so this is like one of the, the, I think the second to last slide that I have here, but I just included this um, because I, I think in the last, uh, you know, six months, uh, obviously with some of the changes that have happened in the region, uh, you know, particularly um, you know, you know, on the back of the Russian-Ukraine conflict, what we've seen is Kazakhstan and President Tokayev has taken very much a leadership role. Uh, in that region, uh, and, and I, I this is, these are my words, these aren't from the ambassador or from Nurland, but to me, the more that I read, the more that I follow, Kazakhstan is very much becoming the center of the center part of, of Central Asia. And in September, President Xi was, was in Kazakhstan, it was the first place he visited after two and a half years of not leaving the country uh, because of the important relationship that, uh, that China as a neighbor uh, has with Kazakhstan. Uh, but then immediately, you know, President Tokayev was in uh, New York. I know Galmazan uh, was part of that in terms of organizing uh, U.S. business leader meetings in New York and Washington. Uh, and then immediately back uh, in, uh, in Santa playing uh, ping pong with uh, the Turkish president, uh, Erdogan. We have a representative here from the Turkish embassy as well. And of course, we we're talking about the long and storied history between uh, Turkey and, and Kazakhstan. And then only uh, two weeks later, the uh, president of the European Council uh, in Kazakhstan uh, discussing with President Tokayev and, and the government around the importance of critical minerals uh, and really those the ability to supply critical minerals from Kazakhstan into Europe. Uh, and so it is an exciting time uh, in Kazakhstan and is, you know, I'll close with uh, just a brief note, a fellow that uh, I met last year originally uh, from Russia, uh, grew up in Perth, lives in London, uh, married to a Kazakh, building a house in Almaty, and he told me a year ago, he said, Darren, if you haven't been to Kazakhstan in the last five years, you haven't been to Kazakhstan. That's how much has changed. Uh, and you can see there a, a picture of uh, Astana, where uh, Jordi and I had dinner at a nice restaurant uh, only a few months ago, and um, that's a picture I took out of my hotel room on my first visit to Astana. So I was um, pretty surprised. Uh, so thank you very much. I appreciate your attention today, and uh, thank you very much, Darren. Um, our next speaker is Limjan Matea from uh, Kazakh Invest, and I think he's going to discuss some of the investment opportunities, probably in the mineral sector, um, available for prospective investors in Kazakhstan. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, uh, good day, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, let me welcome all of you on behalf of Kazakh Invest and to express gratitude to our partners from CDC, our mother Tatiana, for organizing this conference, for organizing this conference. Definitely, uh, definitely, uh, it's a pleasure to be here on Cooler the Digital City anytime, even during, during pandemic. But it's also true that today, uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my short presentation, uh, you know, uh, Darren already did a great part of my work. <laughs> That's why I will, be, I will just shortly to mention. Uh, my short presentation will cover uh, some information about uh, some uh, new approaches in our energy sector and some opportunities in mining sector. As you know, energy sector are one of the most important sectors for our economy uh, and, uh, because uh, mining about new approaches. Yeah. Uh, let's next slide, please. Uh, 
uh, today, uh, as it was mentioned, today 80% of all greenhouse gas emissions in Kazakhstan are associated with, uh, with the production of energy from fossil fuels. This is the main factor uh, that has a negative impact on the country's climate. Therefore, modernization, modernization of the energy industry is of crucial importance for us. White, widespread adopt, adoption of green and energy efficient technologies are core tools to achieve Kazakhstan's long-term goal of carbon neutrality. Kazakhstan pursues uh, consistent and active climate policy. Our country was the first in the EIS region to ratify the Paris Agreement, which has become a turning point in the international climate agenda. Red force in terms of carbon intensity among 2021 countries globally, according to the global to the global carbon effort, we have set the ambitious goal of achieving, of achieving carbon neutrality by 2060. Considering that almost 70 percent of our uh, of our electricity is generated by coal, this achievement will require significant structural changes in the country's industry and economy. Our draft strategy for achieving uh, carbon neutrality by 2060 provides for massive economic, technological, and social transformation. This strategy will be adopted soon. According to experts, to experts the global market for green hydrogen will be formed over the next 10 years. Today, our country is at the stage of uh, exploring the possibility of implementing uh, large projects in the field of green hydrogen production. Foreign investors are ready to explore various regions of Kazakhstan for implementing large scale projects. Kazakhstan is set to integrate uh, into the new global energy supply chain. A possible solution is to export the hydrogen produced in Kazakhstan to the market of the European Union. At the government level, together with our Ministry of uh, Energy, Kazakhstan, we are supporting two mega projects by foreign investors, whereby Kazakhstan acts as a strategic consultant. Next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, let me briefly elaborate of the renewable energy sector that has high development potential. Today, environmental, social, government criteria factors are gaining significant traction. As such, in accordance with the goal set by the green economy concept, Kazakhstan reached 3% share of renewable energy in the energy mix in 2020. We aim to reach 15% by 2030 and 50% by 2050 and ultimately reach carbon neutrality by 2060. In this, Kazakhstan has significant potential to develop the sector. Uh, existing potential of wind energy is estimated at, at 220 billion kilowatts per year. Solar energy, 3,000 hours per year, and hydropower, 62 billion kilowatts per year. In this regard, the state is improving the regulatory environment, creating the most attractive conditions for investors. In 2018, Kazakhstan introduced renewable energy auction, whereby the government signed a power purchasing agreement with successful bidders for 15 years. Auction winners are also entitled to exemption from electricity transmission fees, priority dispatch, and investment preferences. Such measures enable to double the number of renewable energy facilities and reach 2010 megawatts of installed capacity. Today, companies like General Electric, Amy, 
total federal solar hydro china and other successfully operate in the sector. Auctions usually take place in October each year, and we invite Canadian companies to participate in the development of renewable energy sector in Kazakhstan. In general, according to the government plan by 2035, Kazakhstan will introduce 6.5 gigawatts of new renewable energy capacity. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see here, my colleagues uh, already mentioned uh, a lot of information about mining sector, about the importance uh, just the, the World Bank, uh, you know, it's made that there are over 5,000 and export deposits still present in Kazakhstan, valued at over $46 trillion. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can see uh, conceptual innovation, and uh, our ambassador, Mr. Kamalinov, has already talked about some important initiatives aimed to improve the investment potential of the mining industry in accordance with international standards. And uh, you know, uh, it's uh, already mentioned, and uh, Darren already mentioned about his colleagues, uh, some colleagues from Canada, uh, which they work in Almaty, in Pavlodar, in other regions. They say, oh, we like Canada, but I like living in Almaty because it's more convenient than some Canadians. It's, it's, it's not my work, it's, uh, it's <laughs> Canadian thing. Next slide, please. Here you can see prospects for the development of the mining and metallurgy industry, and you can see that it's just main direction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you can see uh, just generally uh, because of time shortage, it's lithium, fuel, nickel, and cobalt deposits, and vanadium deposits. I mean, it's some uh, it's some uh, direction where. Uh, where Kazakh invest and together with investors could provide information and it, it could be interesting for a Canadian uh, companies and investors as well. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, with, the purpose, with the purpose of uh, promoting investment proposals effectively, Kazakh invest is cooperating with big four companies and consulting companies for preparing project documentation according to international standards. Having analyzed project feasibility, uh, we selected over 40 niche projects in mining for subsequent proposal to potential investors. Detailed business plan and financial models have been developed for each project, with more details on the project, market analysis, key financial indicators, and competitive advantages. Our aim is to match these opportunities with suitable for investors. Next slide, please. Uh, now briefly about Kazakh Invest. Our organization is the National Investment Promotion Agency, the unified investment operator of the Republic of Kazakhstan. We provide a full range of services to support investment activities and advance particular projects. Kazakh Invest can act as your ultimate investment guide in Kazakhstan. For potential investors, we provide detailed country information, market overviews, as well as specific investment proposals. We organize targeted visits to Kazakhstan. We set up meetings with central government bodies and local authorities, together together with our colleagues uh, from uh, from embassies. We have representatives in all regions. Important service. Uh, in all the regions. Important service is business matchmaking. We assist in searching for a strong local partners. Then we assist in project structuring and provide various options for financing. We guide investors all the way through the project implementation stage. And even after a successful launch, we provide continuous aftercare support on the questions investors my help in doing business in Kazakhstan. Thank you for your attention.
Okay. Um, well, thank you, everybody. That was our discussion. I think um, we probably have time for one or two minutes. Any questions, maybe, if there's any? The majority is just keen to answer something. I'm <laughs> um, throwing something at them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of us. Uh, okay, thank, you. thank you, guys. Yeah, I know that everyone is uh, is probably uh, running to uh, uh, to the uh, round up site. Uh, so um, my role at the moment is up to ask if uh, there are any questions uh, from the audience to our speakers. So are there any? I have a question. Yeah, we heard uh, particularly from Darren how conducive the <coughs> my revised mining uh, code is in, in Kazakhstan uh, uh, for Western companies. But uh, my question is to uh, Mark Ward. I noticed that your majority of your activities you tended to focus on uh, Uzbekistan. So I was wondering if you could um, compare the two and contrast the two mining laws, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Are they similar? In, in uh, sort of like orientation stance, or I hate to say it, but you're out of luck with me. <laughs> I don't know the details of those two mining laws. In fact, one of um, one of the guys sitting here might be better. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't say with detail around regard to Uzbekistan, and so unfortunately, we don't have someone here. But I, I think that um, you know, from some of the discussions that I've had as well, I think definitely um, they're they're trying to follow in Kazakhstan's footsteps. I think there's still more of um, uh, historical sort of bent to how it's set as, as opposed to Kazakhstan where four or five years ago uh, as I was mentioning you know the, the country kind of took Western Australia Ontario and, and <clears throat> Quebec and really modernized it so there's still a lot of um, I think influence and participation from some of the state-owned uh, mining and exploration companies in, in Uzbekistan is my understanding um, I would agree with that but I, but I think they're um, they're watching their neighbors um, Closely. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we're wrapping up. Um, before uh, we adjourn, I would like to give a quick word to the uh, Vice President of the AME, uh, uh, so well-known person, uh, Jonathan Bushman. Uh, thank you very much, Tatiana. Uh, so I'm uh, Jonathan Buchanan, uh, Vice President of Policy and Advocacy with the Association for Mineral Exploration, uh, and uh, we're based in Vancouver, and uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, Tatiana and her team on organizing this successful uh, 12th Annual Mining Conference. Uh, so very well done, and uh, this panel was great, so for lots of different perspectives. Of course, we encourage you to come down to Roundup, uh, join the critical metal session where uh, Tim Barry of the Eris is uh, presenting this afternoon and in the core shot tomorrow and Thursday, I believe. So uh, that's great. Uh, for those who know, know the association, uh, we've been around since 1912, uh, so focusing on mineral exploration development in BC. Uh, but we also have corporate members who are active in around 36 countries, including Mongolia. Uh, we have individual members uh, based probably in 100 countries, uh, including Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, so it's, uh, Roundup is a great place to meet uh, people from around the world, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing many of you there. And uh, with that, uh, yeah, have a great uh, time in Vancouver if uh, you're visiting, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at Roundup. Thanks, Robin. To, to mention that we are really grateful to uh, our mineral exploration CC for continued support of, uh, of our event, uh, which is uh, probably uh, the only one which is focused specifically on Central Asia. And I really hope that the presentation or representation of Central Asian countries like Kazakhstan, like Mongolia, and Turkey, at the uh, roundup in the future will be much more substantial, uh, same way as it is uh, happening at PTHD and in Toronto. So thank you, Jonathan, again, and uh, uh, thank you everyone for participating in our event. Um, one more uh, one more time, our organization is uh, is happy to help everyone who would like to. Uh, go and uh, make business uh, in Central Asia. Um, from the presentation which I saw, um, I see a role of our organization is currently strengthening and growing uh, towards the, uh, the other um, uh, countries. 
but we are really happy with uh, our partnership with uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, Ambassador Kamalkinov is, is a very dear friend of ours, and uh, we have a substantial organization uh, established uh, between Canada and uh, Kazakhstan, which is uh, Canada Kazakhstan Business Council, KCBT. And we are planning a new uh, session of KCBT probably end of this year or beginning next. And uh, um, uh, there is uh, a very active development uh, uh, between our organization in Mongolia. Today we have a small delegation from Mongolia led by Tomo Bonchik, who is also president of uh, our silver sponsor, uh, GTAC uh, LLC. So uh, we are planning uh, missions to Kazakhstan, missions to Mongolia. Uh, I hope in the future we will be uh, uh, extending our activities with Uzbekistan, Turkey, and the other countries. Uh, so keep in touch with us. And uh, thank you again for attending this event. So we are now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.